on behalf of myself and Dr. Ashley Bell, who is uh, helping facilitate today's meeting. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone to this one, uh, particular webinar. We are in about week six of a weekly webinar series that we started back in April. We've got a couple of more of these to do uh, before we switch gears and go to a monthly schedule. And we will show uh, the remaining webinar topics uh, towards the end of today's webinar. Uh, we have quite a few people on uh, today's uh, webinar that are registered from not only outside of Illinois, but actually outside of the United States. And we want to welcome all of those people. Uh, and because of that, I'd like to take just a little bit of time just to explain a little bit about um, the term extension. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with what University of Illinois Extension is, it's, it's essentially an outreach arm of the University of Illinois. What we do is we take research that's done by the University of Illinois and other universities and turn it into programs for the general public. And I myself work in the area of energy and environmental stewardship. And the particular areas that I focus on is in the area of weather and climate, soils, and a little bit in the area of water quality. And actually today's webinar came about from a webinar I did back in April on atmospheric optics. And we had several people that requested this particular topic. So that's why we're doing it today. And as you can see uh, from this first slide, uh, we will have an evaluation at the end of the webinar. We will have this uh, link available again. And we'll also have a, a QR code that somebody that wants to do this on a uh, phone would be able to do so. So let's go ahead and get started. So today's webinar is about the, the greenhouse effect. And uh, sometimes this is a subject that can be kind of polarizing. I just want to start things off by saying we are not going to be trying to provide any solutions for today's topic. What we are going to try to do is provide just the basic scientific processes of how the greenhouse effect works. A lot of people have heard that term, the greenhouse effect, but if they had to really explain it to someone else, they, they may not be able to, to get into much detail about it. So that's what we're going to do. Now, when I say we're gonna get into detail, it's still gonna be in a pretty general sense. We're not gonna get into anything like mathematic equations or anything like that, uh, or detailed chemistry. Uh, we're just gonna be talking about this in pretty simple terms, but to give a little bit more detail of, of how all of this comes together. So what will be discussed in this webinar? First of all, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the earth is heated from the sun. Then we're gonna get into how that energy, that heat that re is received by the sun, in turn gets transferred to the atmosphere, and then how that energy goes back out into space. And then the main topics that we're gonna be talking about is the greenhouse effect. And some of you may be aware that there's a natural greenhouse effect and then something called the enhanced greenhouse effect. So we'll be talking about what both of those things are. And then we'll also be talking about greenhouse gases in particular and their concentrations and how they've changed in recent times. So to start off with, we're gonna talk a little bit about solar energy or in other words, that energy that's produced by the sun. We know that the sun's hot. We know that we get the vast majority or practically all of the energy that we get here on earth, we can trace back at some point to have come from the sun. As that sun gives off energy, and we're not gonna talk about photons or the, the particles that are, are part of this, but we're just gonna talk about how that energy is transferred in the form of waves and that heat, that energy does travel in a straight line, but it travels in a wave fashion. And there's many different lengths of these waves. How do we measure these? Well, we, we talk about wavelengths. And essentially all a wavelength is, like this figure at the bottom, is talking about the distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next. That's all a wavelength is. The thing to know about wavelengths and, and what they are and how long or short they are is based on temperature. 
the hotter something is, the shorter the wavelengths are that's going to be given off by that object. We know the sun is hot. At the surface of the sun, it's about 5,000 degrees. Now that's even much cooler than what it is at the very core of the sun, which is about 15 million degrees. But the hotter an object is, the shorter the wavelengths are that's given off by that object. We also know that the Earth is much cooler than the sun. The Earth's average temperature is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So the wavelengths it gives off are much, much longer. But the other thing to know is everything, every single object gives off wavelengths of energy. You may be sitting in a chair right now. That chair is giving off energy. If you're sitting at a table, that table is giving off energy. Every single object everywhere gives off wavelengths of energy. Even in deep space, there's a little bit of energy that's given off. Now, when we talk about these wavelengths and we say that they're really short, what does that really mean? How short are these things? Well, we, we know that they're going to be really small because that energy is, is from a hot object. And we measure these wavelengths in a unit called microns. Now, some of you may have heard that term before. Maybe a lot haven't. So how big is a micron? A micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. It takes a little over 25 millimeters to equal one inch. Now, we can talk about that in terms of numbers. But to try to give you a better, better visual, if we expanded the circumference of a human hair to the size of that outside circle, a pollen grain would be about the size of that dark circle, and a micron would still only be the size of that little dot that you see. Microns are really, really tiny. And so these wavelengths that we're talking about are also really, really tiny. The wavelengths that are given off by the sun and other objects, there's a multitude of different wavelengths of energy involved with this. And if we combine all of these together, they're called the electromagnetic spectrum because they have electric and magnetic properties. Now, what you see on this uh, slide, and some of these slides are gonna look a little bit complicated, we're, we're not, you're not going to have quiz on or anything on these. So uh, I just want to point out a few basic things with this. Most of the energy that the sun gives off is going to be in the wavelengths that are on the right hand side of that slide. Most of the energy that the earth gives off is going to be on the left hand side of that slide. But I want to talk a little bit about some of these different wavelengths of energy and what, what their sizes are. The energy that the sun first produces in the very core of the sun, where it's about 15 million degrees, are in the form of something called gamma wave waves. These are, as you can see, really, really tiny wavelengths. They're about the width of atomic particles. Now, as those wavelengths, as that energy works its way out to the sun, they start getting weaker, they start getting cooler, and those wavelengths get longer. We move from gamma rays into X-rays. Now, you may have heard of gamma rays before. I'm sure everybody has heard of X-rays before because probably almost everyone that's listening today has had an X-ray of their body at some point, whether they had a broken bone or for some other reason. X-rays are really powerful forms of energy, less powerful than gamma waves, but X-rays are strong enough that it can easily pass through flesh but can't pass through bone. That's why we use it. Both gamma rays and x-rays, if we had them here on the Earth's surface, would not be good for life on Earth. There essentially wouldn't be life on Earth because they would be too powerful. It would kill out everything. The good thing is that that type of energy doesn't come through to Earth and doesn't get through the atmosphere. The other part of this is, even if it did come to the Earth's surface, we as humans could not see it. It's invisible to us as humans. It could reach our eyes, but it would not be visible to us. Then we get into the ultraviolet spectrum. These are a little bit longer wavelengths of energy, 
And actually, a very tiny fraction of this actually makes it through to the Earth's surface. How do we know that? Well, for anyone that gets outside in the sun, you've probably heard that it's not good to have bare skin in any direct sunlight for long periods of time because of that little bit of ultraviolet en energy. That ultraviolet energy, much weaker than x-rays, but still strong enough that it can penetrate a few layers of skin. And if we're exposed to too much of that for too long a period, you can get sunburn or for chronic exposure to it, you may end up with different types of, of skin lesions. You may end up with eye cataracts, those types of things. Now, luckily, a large part of that ultraviolet part of the spectrum is also filtered out in the upper part of the atmosphere, but a tiny portion of it does get down to the Earth's surface. Now you see that portion kind of in the middle of the slide where we have this rainbow of colors. Out of all the energy that the sun produces, that the Earth gives off, that all different objects give off, we can only see a very, very tiny part of all of that, and that is called the visible spectrum. Very tiny, and because it's so tiny, that's why in this slide they've taken it and widened it out up above. How do we see that? Normally, we just see it as white light. But occasionally, if we're looking at a rainstorm where the sun is shining on that rain, that light is bent enough that we can see individual colors, which represent individual wavelengths of energy. And that is that visible light that we can see that we as humans can take in through our eyes and our brains can comprehend. Once we get past that and get into longer wavelengths, especially those that are given off by the Earth, that goes back to being invisible. We cannot see those longer wavelengths of energy. That infrared part of the spectrum, a lot of times you may hear, think of that as thermal energy, um, but that is largely in the area that the Earth is giving off, going back into space, and then we get into longer and longer wavelengths of energy, and the thing to know is the longer the wavelengths are, the weaker they become. By the time you get into especially long radio waves, they are very weak. And that's one reason why if you listen to an AM radio, you get lots of static when there's a thunderstorm or if you go underneath electrical lines because they're disrupted very easily. Now with this slide, a couple of things that I wanna point out, you see two basically hills on this um, slide. And you notice the height of them are the same. Let's tell, first of all, that's telling you that what energy we receive from the sun goes back out. But the wavelength is different. Where you see that, that hill on the left, or that crest on the left, whatever you wanna call it, our wave, that's the incoming energy from the sun. That's what that visible spectrum of light is representing there with all those colors. And you can see it goes from about 0.4 to 0.7 microns in size. That's the wavelengths of the visible part of the spectrum that we can see. And those wavelengths, again, are short because it came from the sun, which is a very hot object. The Earth, much, much cooler. The wavelengths that are given off by that are much longer. But what comes in goes out. The other thing to know is that energy that comes from the sun doesn't for the most part, heat the atmosphere directly. There's just a fraction of that that actually directly heats the atmosphere. Most of it travels right through all of that air, all of that atmosphere, doesn't interact with it. It hits the Earth's surface, the Earth's surface absorbs that energy, and then that energy is transferred back into the atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere is mostly heated by the Earth's surface not directly by the sun. Once that atmosphere, or once that transfer of heat goes from the surface to the atmosphere, that energy escapes back out into space. Now, how does that heat gets transferred once it is absorbed by the Earth's surface? There's a number of different ways that that happens. One way is through conduction. Now, if anybody has been around a, a fire and maybe held on to a metal rod that you had one end of in the fire, that heat is conducted from one end of that metal rod to the other. That is an example of conduction. 
Now, actually, the atmosphere is not a very good conductor of heat energy. So if we had to rely just on conduction by itself to heat the atmosphere, it wouldn't do a very good job of it. Same way with convection. Convection, think of a hot air balloon. When you have warm air, that warm air becomes less dense. It becomes more buoyant. It rises up. And that's what convection does. Anytime you see those white puffy clouds, those cumulus clouds on any given day, what's happening is air is rising up from the Earth's surface, cooling, condensing, and creating those little puffy clouds. So that's an example of convection. Another heat transfer process that you may not have heard before is something called latent heat. We have lots of water vapor in the atmosphere. When that water vapor, which is the gaseous form of water, when that water vapor condenses back into liquid water, it releases heat into the atmosphere. That's actually a very important way that heat gets transferred from one place to another uh, in the atmosphere is through that latent heat process. And with all of these things, one of the things that, that also happens is that heat, as it's trying to escape back out into space, gets slowed down in its escape by what we call the greenhouse effect. Now with this slide, everybody is looking at it and probably saying, oh my God, this is, this is too complex for me to even look at. We're not gonna go through all of this on here. There's just, again, a couple of things that I wanna point out with this. First of all, if you look over on the left-hand side where it says incoming solar radiation, it says 100 units and you don't have to worry about what measurements we're using or the number or anything. But the main thing is just look at that number, compare that to the outgoing radiation loss to space. You see the numbers are the same. What that's telling you is whatever energy we receive from the sun, it goes back out. We do not keep it. The other thing I want to point out is over on the right hand side, down towards the bottom, you see some red squiggly arrows going up. Right next to them, you see some red squiggly arrows going down. That is trying to represent the greenhouse effect. So essentially what's happening is you're having heat that's trying to escape, but some of it gets re-radiated back towards the Earth's surface. We're going to explain that process here in just uh, the next few slides. So let's talk a little bit about greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect. First of all, just to talk a little bit about gases in the atmosphere. Out of all the gases in the atmosphere, there's about 99% made up of just two gases, nitrogen and oxygen. And both of those in the gas form are made up of two atoms of nitrogen together to make up nitrogen gas or two atoms of oxygen together to make up oxygen, which is the type of oxygen our bodies need. So if you add those two totals up, or two percentages up, just by themselves, they make up 99% of all the gases in the atmosphere. Everything else, just a tiny portion of the gases. Argon makes up a little less than 1%. So now we're down to all the other gases in the atmosphere being less than one-tenth of 1% of all the gases in the atmosphere. So they're trace amounts of gases, very, very small amounts. It was discovered way back in the 1800s that some of these gases, especially these trace gases that are in the atmosphere, some of them had the ability to absorb and re-radiate heat. So this was done way back in the 1800s. This is not something that's new and has just come into play in the last 10 or 20 or 50 years. This has been known since the 1800s. One of the first people that, that discovered this was uh, Joseph Fourier. He discovered that certain gases could absorb and raise the, uh, absorb heat and raise the temperature of the planet. In 1859, John T Tyndall uh, established that specifically carbon dioxide and water vapor were some of the gases that could do this. And so they had the ability to absorb heat and then radiate that heat back off. And then towards the end of the 1800s, Savanti Arrhenius uh, showed that if you increase carbon dioxide concentrations, that would have the potential of raising the Earth's temperature. 
So all of this work was done way back in the 1800s. What are some of the greenhouse gases? Well, probably you've all heard of carbon dioxide. That, that is the one that's usually talked about. But another one is methane. Another one is something called nitrous oxide. And one that you probably haven't heard of as being a greenhouse gas is water vapor. Remember I said that water vapor, when it um, evapor or when it uh, condenses, it gives off heat. So it is also a greenhouse gas. Another slide here that looks really complicated, but again, we're just gonna to touch on some of the basic things here. Up at the very top, again, you see where that visible spectrum is, that's our incoming solar radiation. And then over towards the right, you see a smaller hump, that's the outgoing radiation. So the energy that, energy that comes in is kind of spread out, but then we have a little area in there from about eight to 10 microns where it doesn't really interact any with the atmosphere. That's actually called an atmospheric window. And so for those wavelengths of energy that's going out into space, it's essentially a direct shot. There's no gases, no greenhouse gases or anything that really absorb that to any great extent. Now, the one thing that can slow the escape of those wavelengths of energy is low cloud cover. And so that's why in the, at nighttime, especially for ex example in the winter, if you've got a low cloud cover at nighttime, it will actually keep the, the area a little bit warmer than it would be on a clear sky because with a clear sky, that atmospheric window is wide open and allows all of those wavelengths of energy to escape very quickly at nighttime and so that lowers the temperature. At nighttime, or, uh, when we do have low cloud cover, it kind of, kind of shuts that down a little bit. And so that's why you have warmer temperatures under those situations. But you notice that carbon dioxide, that CO2, and then water have the ability to absorb certain wavelengths of energy. That's where you're seeing those little dark up hills present. So the thing to, to realize with this is that these greenhouse gases only absorb certain wavelengths of energy. But it just so happens that a lot of these wavelengths are also in the wavelengths that are given off by the Earth. That's trying to allow that, that energy to escape. Now, the one thing I'd wanna point out, and if you don't get anything else from this webinar, hopefully you will get this part. Those greenhouse gases do not keep that energy or heat. They radiate it back off. So they absorb it and then re-radiate it. And I know lots of, of people, lots of scientists, lots of others use the word trap. And that's, that's kind of a, a common word that's used. I don't like the word because it makes it sound like that, hey, heat is kept forever. It is not. I'm gonna say this time and time again. What we're talking about is a slowing of the release of heat. We are not trapping it. So when this energy is absorbed by a greenhouse gas, it gives it back off, but when it gives it off, it radiates it out in all directions. So some of it goes up a little bit higher in the atmosphere, but a lot of it gets sent out to the side or back down again. And so what happens is it kind of spreads out sideways and some of it migrates upward. And so what, it, what happens is you get this up and down motion where some of this heat radiates back down towards the Earth's surface, heats the Earth's surface back up, the air surface gives that energy back off. So what's essentially happening is it's slowing that process of escape. It's not keeping that heat forever, but in the process of doing that, it makes the air surface a little bit warmer. That is what the natural greenhouse effect is. This natural greenhouse effect has been around since almost the beginning of Earth's history. It is just a natural process. And by itself, that natural greenhouse effect, I would think most people would agree would be a good thing. Because if we had absolutely no greenhouse gases in the atmosphere whatsoever, instead of having an average temperature of the Earth of 59 degrees, Earth's average temperature would be around zero. So just having that natural greenhouse effect is actually beneficial 
for life on Earth. That's the natural greenhouse effect. So what, what allows these greenhouse gases to be present in the atmosphere? It's just a part of nature. We have decomposition of organic material, which is carbon-based, which allows carbon dioxide to go up in the atmosphere. That can happen through decomposition of vegetation, decomposition of organic matter in soils, decomposition of organic material in swamps. Uh, and with the swamps, it's um, as much methane as it is carbon dioxide. We can also get uh, greenhouse gases going up by forest fires. We can get it going up by volcanic eruptions. A couple of other ways that you can have natural causes of greenhouse gases. Just that respiration of plants and animals give off carbon dioxide. And then the other thing, remember with water vapor, when water vapor um, gets into the atmosphere, it's storing that heat. So the process of evaporation of changing liquid water into water vapor stores that heat in that water vapor until it's condensed back to liquid when it releases it back into the air. We get the questions of how long do these greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere? And there's not really one clear cut answer in terms of, of a certain number of years. These numbers that I'm showing you are to be guidelines. But since this is, at least in terms of the natural greenhouse, a natural process, like most things in nature, all of these things go through cycles. The atmosphere has a way of interacting with these greenhouse gases, and they do slowly compose, decompose and recycle over the course of time. For carbon dioxide, that could be anywhere from a few years up to several hundred years. For methane, not quite as long, about 12 years. For nitrous oxide, a little over 100 years. So again, as this heat is trying to escape Earth, that greenhouse effect will slow down that escape. It's just cause and effect. It's a natural thing that happens. Say, I'm saying this again, the heat still escapes. It just takes longer for it to do so. And if we add more greenhouse gases, that cause and effect is still gonna take place. And that's when we get into talking about the enhanced greenhouse effect. If we add more greenhouse gases, it's gonna take longer for that heat to escape just part of that cause and effect. And in turn, what that will do is it will slightly raise Earth's average temperature. And I say slightly raise because the Earth is a very huge object. And we're, we can talk about the slightly raising in terms of degrees, Fahrenheit or Celsius. Now let's talk a little bit about how greenhouse levels have changed. Now on the left-hand side, this actually goes back a very long time. This goes back 800,000 years, but you can see for carbon dioxide, it's ranged anywhere from about uh, 100, 175 up to about 300 parts per million. Now remember, we said that these gases are trace gases, very small amounts in the atmosphere. So that's why we use the term parts per million. If you went out and you were able to grab randomly a million molecules, gas molecules in the atmosphere, on average, this is saying over the course of time, there would have been about 175 to about 300 of those air molecules that would have been carbon dioxide. But then as we get close to the present, you see that sharp spike upward. And if we go just from 1950 to 2020, you see how that level has raised from about a little over 300 to a little over 400 parts per million. For methane, again, on the left-hand side, this goes back 800,000 years to the present. You can see again, it's gone through uh, cycles that average between about 400 to maybe 600 parts per billion. Now, instead of parts per million, this one is even smaller, parts per billion. Then in recent times, you can see how that one has spiked up. 
And if you go over to the right hand side where it shows the, the decades from 1950 to 2020, you can see that it's gone from about 1200 up to about 1800 parts per billion in the last 60 or 70 years. For nitrous oxide, again, kind of the same thing. You're seeing that it, it kind of ranged uh, from about you know, around 190 up to about 300 parts per billion. You can see that spike up towards the present era. And then from 1950 to 2015, you can see how those levels have raised. So then the next question is, well, how are we changing? How is this, uh, these increase in concentrations, where are they coming from? The science has looked at this a, very extensively as well. And they cannot be attributed to things like just volcanic activity or forest fires or those types of things, those natural causes by itself. Where it really strongly appears to be coming from is from the burning of fossil fuels, the loss of soil organic matter, and deforestation. When we look at how these processes, once they get into the atmosphere, and we show those lifetime, uh, average lifespans of gases once they get in the atmosphere, Again, those are natural processes that take those greenhouse gases and turn them into something and recycle them over the course of time. But those operate very slowly. For example, if you're trying to, if you build up soil organic matter, that will take carbon dioxide out of the air because it turns it into carbon in the soil. But it takes very long times for those, to, for you to get a stable form of organic matter in the soil. It takes a 400 or 500 years even to get an inch of good soil production, of soil development. And so we're talking hundreds of years for that type of process to take place. Rock formation, we're talking about millions of years. Forest, for forests to build up, we're talking decades or hundreds of years for that. And the degradation of nitrogen over the course of time, again, that's a very, very slow process. If we want to talk about volcanic eruptions and you know with with the current situation that we've had with the with COVID-19 uh, I don't really want to talk about another uh, potential thing that could happen but we have been very lucky on earth the last 200 years or more we have not had a massive volcanic eruption since the 1800s there was a, a pretty large uh, one that occurred in 1912, but it was those two, Tambora and Krakatoa, in the 1800s that really affected the whole earth in terms of short-term climate change. Dropped the earth's overall temperature substantially for a couple of years afterwards, caused massive famine around the world, massive crop failures. We have not had anything like that on earth for over 200 years. Hopefully we don't have anything like that in the near future. But when we look at global greenhouse gas emissions and we look at it by economic sector, there's, there's really three or four main areas that we can look at. Electricity and heat production is one area because a lot of that is fossil fuel derived. Agriculture, forestry and other land use that makes up almost about the same percentage. And then general industrial use, again, using a lot of fossil fuels. Transportation, that's uh, slowly dropping down uh, compared to where it was. Uh, and so those three things are really the areas where we're adding huge amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. On the agricultural side, where you see those red areas and that's um, uh, crop areas, uh, where you see the uh, red shading, that is where uh, you've had large amounts of soil carbon loss because, and research has shown this all over the world, when you till the soil, it adds more oxygen into the soil. The microbes are, are aerobic microbes. They like that extra oxygen. Soil organic matter is depleted. And so, 
when you have tilling of the soil, you're going to have a loss of organic matter. That goes up into the air as carbon dioxide. And you can see there are some areas, smaller areas of the world where there has been some increases, but the decreases are greater than the increases. And one thing we haven't talked about is uh, in terms of water vapor. Have, have humans had effect on water vapor? Essentially, no. We don't have a direct effect on that. So we really don't talk about that a whole lot in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations because we really don't have any, any play in that. The one thing to know though is as the Earth's atmosphere warms, its ability to hold water vapor does increase. And so there would be a greater probability of evaporation. So you're going to have more water vapor in the atmosphere. So as that water vapor condenses, more heat is going to be released into the atmosphere. So uh, we, we're Getting close to the end of, of what I want to talk about. I want to leave lots of time for questions. Uh, I want to show just a few things here. This is actually showing global land and ocean temperatures. And this is just for the months of January, going from 1880 to the present time. And you can see, especially since about 1980 on, we have had a steady increase of temperature. We go ahead and look at June. Again, this is just for the month of June basically the same thing. From about 1980 on, we have had an increase in our monthly temperatures. This is worldwide, and this is both for land temperatures and ocean temperatures. So as you might expect, if we look at the Earth average temperature since 1880, we've had an increase, especially from 1980 until the present. That's very steady, very substantial increase in temperature. So with that, I know that's a, a fairly quick explanation for this and doesn't get, in, doesn't get into a whole lot of detail. I did not want to get into a whole lot of detail, but some of the takeaways hopefully you can get from this presentation. First of all, that sun energy, that solar energy gives off short wavelengths while the earth gives off longer wavelengths of energy simply because it's a cooler temperature. The other big takeaway, Whatever energy the Earth receives, it gives off. We have specific gases in the atmosphere that have the ability to absorb and release or re-radiate energy. These are the ones we call greenhouse gases. The greenhouse effect by itself is a natural occurrence. But if you increase greenhouse gas concentrations, which has happened in about the last 150 years, it's just a, a it's a natural thing that's going to happen, but you're going to have an enhanced greenhouse effect because of that. And I'll mention this again, greenhouse gases do not keep that energy. All they're doing is a slowing is its escape to space. When you've got those greenhouse gas concentrations increasing, it's going to, again, make Earth's temperature higher. And those greenhouse gas concentrations have gone up considerably in the last 150 years. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, close up here and leave plenty of time for questions. A couple of things though, before we get to the questions, I do wanna mention we still have two more webinars coming up in our weekly series. Next week at one o'clock on June 18th, we're gonna have a home energy checkup webinar. And then on June 25th, I'll be back to talk about clouds and uh, all about different types of clouds, what kind of weather to expect with these clouds, uh, and maybe show some clouds that you may not have seen before. Uh, if you want more information on these, you can check out the link below or just do a search for Illinois Everyday Environment, and it should bring up that website right at the top. So I'm going to leave this slide up while we go to questions. So Ashley, um, I don't know if we have very many questions, but if you want to kind of uh, start off and, and give me the first one, we'll go from there. Yes, so um, what are sources of nitrous oxide? Uh, that is a good question. Um, that can come from a number of different areas. It can come from 
um, fertilization of fields through nitrogen fertilizer. It's also produced uh, by vehicle emissions. And uh, those are, are two big ways. Uh, the vehicle emissions, nitrous oxide, if anybody ever talks about um, ozone pollution, nitrous oxide is also a, a component in that. But those are two big ways uh, that it can be done uh, through uh, human enhancements. And I'm guessing that's where they, they wanted the, the, the question to go to. So can you explain what are these sources of methane emissions beyond um, cattle? Okay. Um, well, let's first talk about some natural sources of methane. Uh, there is methane that is within the Earth's interior, and we get that, uh, we extract that. It's called natural gas. Um, some of that will seep out, but another big source of methane naturally is from swamps. Uh, when organic material falls into a swamp, nature will try to decompose it. Unfortunately, or I don't know whether you'd say unfortunately, just naturally, because no oxygen is going to be present in that water saturated environment, anaerobic bacteria are going to decompose that organic material. Anaerobic bacteria don't need oxygen to function but they're much more inefficient than aerobic bacteria and they give off the byproduct of methane. So when you hear the term swamp gas, essentially what that is, is just a form of methane. Another natural source of methane is actually found down at the bottom of oceans and in permafrost areas. There's frozen methane in both of those areas. They're called uh, uh, methane hydrates and if you've ever seen a documentary uh, that, that has examined this, it's kind of interesting. I've seen some pictures where a diver has gone down, brought up some, um, some of this frozen methane, and then once it got on the boat, we'll light it up and it will burn. And it looks like it's burning ice, but it's this uh, methane hydrate. One of the concerns with this is as the oceans and permafrost areas warm up, those methane hydrates are essentially going to vaporize. And so that's going to add to the amount of methane in the atmosphere. Now, while it started out as a natural source, that warming up of the Earth's surface is going to add to that. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, much more powerful than carbon dioxide. We just don't talk about it quite as much because the concentrations of it are much smaller. Good questions, keep them coming. So what is the best method to estimate the future concentrations of carbon dioxide in your opinion? The best methods? Yes. Uh, well, we've had scientific methods of measuring carbon dioxide since the 1800s. And I'll be honest, I don't do that <laughs> instrumentation myself. Um, and so if, if you're looking for those kind of things, I would suggest, uh, you know, looking more at research articles at specific types of instrumentation. Fortunately, I'm not going to be able to address that particular question. Okay, so years ago, there was a concern over the ozone hole in the atmosphere. So today with the concern being with climate change, how does ozone, it seems that ozone has disappeared from the news. So how does the ozone hole, hole relate to greenhouse gas emissions? Um, uh, somewhat indirectly. Um, what, the culprit for the ozone hole, which occurs mainly over the South Pole, is from a human-made product called chlorofluorocarbons, and that's CFC for short. And there's a long process occurs during the Antarctic winter where CFCs that are in the stratosphere break down. And when sunlight returns over that area, the chlorine part of that CFC is broken off. And when it goes through uh, um, being hit by the sun and that chlorine molecule will destroy many more ozone molecules that can be uh, developed. The ozone area in the stratosphere is the, the thing that actually protects us from most of that ultraviolet energy because there's a natural process where ozone is 
um, essentially broken apart, but then it easily combines back together. And so that concentration of ozone over the course of time has remained steady. But what happens is when you add that chlorine from those chlorofluorocarbons into the stratosphere, that disrupts that whole uh, regeneration process. And that's what creates that ozone hole, which lasts for several months um, during typically the months of September through December. CFCs are an extremely powerful greenhouse gas. But again, we don't really talk a whole lot about that because the concentration of CFCs in the atmosphere are extremely small. We're more concerned about CFCs destroying that stratospheric ozone than we are about it being a greenhouse gas. And because of the international cooperation of governments back in the mid 1980s, the vast majority of CFC production has been banned since that time. And what you've actually seen is a, uh, at least in the last few years, you're beginning to see a little bit of a, a decrease in the size of that ozone hole that's being created, and it doesn't seem to last quite as long. Now, just because we banned that manufacturer back in the, the mid-1980s, it's going to take decades before we can say that we've had a complete success with it. But it does appear that things are slowly getting better with the ozone hole. That's a roundabout way of, of talking about it. But uh, now, <clears throat> the other thing I'll mention is when I mentioned the nitrous oxide and ozone production, ozone pollution, that's when we generate ground level ozone. Ground level ozone is a lung irritant. And so we really don't want huge concentration of ozone at ground level. And that's not a natural thing that occurs for ozone to be in any large concentrations. That only occurs when you've got uh, lots of vehicle emissions, which produce that, that nitrous oxide, and you have, a, along with that, volatile organic compounds, uh, sunlight, and warm temperatures. Those four things is what helps create ground-level ozone. Okay, next question. So do you think carbon offsetting, particularly in the corporate sector, is a promising solution to anthropogenic climate change? I think we have to look at all options. Um, it is something that, and again, you have lots of different people on different parts of the spectrum. They, they each have their own um, objectives, if you will. Uh, but I, I think you have to look at, at all options and what, what will work. Um, you know, and where all of this will go, uh, I think it's really going to be up to our, our children and our grandchildren and great grandchildren to see what the outcomes of all of this is. So given that much of the methane comes from natural sources, how do we explain the spike? Is it just from energy production or natural gas escaping? Yes. Yeah, it's mostly coming from that, from, from gas extraction. Uh, some of it also comes from landfills, where you have huge landfills. Uh, again, the material, organic material in those landfills, because they're sealed so tightly, there's no oxygen in there. And so there's anaerobic bacteria that's breaking that material down. You have a buildup of methane. And if anybody's been around a large landfill, um, unless they're recycling that methane, you may see these large, what looks like torches around here. Essentially what they're doing is they're flaring off that methane. If they don't do that, there have been cases where landfills have actually exploded because of the methane buildup. So while they might be burning off that, that methane, uh, they're still adding carbon dioxide into the air. So um, livestock production, uh, just because of the huge amounts of livestock, that's another source of methane. Uh, one other natural source of methane that um, people may not be aware of are termites, especially in tropical areas where there's just huge amounts of termites, uh, the organic, the cellulose material that they, they digest is digested uh, and produces large amounts of methane. So termites are another source of, of methane. And then, um, you know, uh, during parts of the, uh, the rice production process, uh, when that soil is saturated with water, that can also produce some methane. Those are all big, oh, we have one more question. Oh, there was a comment, so we don't have any additional questions at the moment. 
All right, very good. Well, again, I know that this was, uh, for some people, it may have been very technical. For others, maybe not technical enough. Uh, but I, I just wanted to give a basic ex explanation of the greenhouse effect. Uh, and if anybody would have more questions, you are welcome to contact me. My email address is friend at illinois.edu. You're more than welcome to email me. And if there are no other questions, we will go ahead and sign off. Again, I appreciate your attendance today. And um, hopefully you got something worthwhile of it, out of it. So thank you and um, have a good day.